The Battle of Pea Ridge was a land battle of the American Civil War. It was fought March 6-8, 1862, at Pea Ridge in northwest Arkansas, near Leetown. United States forces, led by Brig. Gen. Samuel Curtis, moved south from central Missouri, driving Confederate forces into northwestern Arkansas. Marge. Gen. Earl Van Dorn launched a Confederate counter-offensive, hoping to recapture northern Arkansas and Missouri. Curtis held off the Confederate attack on the first day and drove Van Dorn's force off the field on the second. The battle, one of the few in which a Confederate army outnumbered its opponent, essentially cemented federal control of Missouri and northern Arkansas. Background United States United States forces in Missouri during the latter part of 1861 and early 1862 had pushed the Missouri State Guard under Marj. Gen. Sterling Price out of the state. By spring 1862, Federal Brig. Gen. Samuel Curtis determined to pursue the Confederates into Arkansas with his Army of the Southwest. Curtis moved his approximately 10,250 federal soldiers and 50 artillery pieces into Benton County, Arkansas, along Little Sugar Creek. Federal forces consisted primarily of soldiers from Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Ohio. Over half the federal soldiers were German immigrants, grouped into the 1st and 2nd Divisions, were under the command of Brig. Gen. Franz Sigel, himself a German immigrant. Upon learning that Curtis would command the army in preference to himself, Sigel threatened to resign. The predominantly native-born regiments were assigned to the 3rd and 4th Divisions to create an ethnic balance among divisions and division commanders. Curtis fortified an excellent defensive position on the north side of the creek, placing artillery for an expected Confederate assault from the south. Due to the length of his supply lines and to a lack of reinforcements he wanted for a further advance, he decided to remain in position. Confederate States Confederate Marge Gen. Earl Van Dorn had been appointed overall commander of the Trans-Mississippi District to quell a simmering conflict between Generals Sterling Price of Missouri and Benjamin McCulloch of Texas. Van Dorn's Army of the West totaled approximately 16,000 men, which included 800 Indian troops, Price's Missouri State Guard contingents and other Missouri units, and McCulloch's contingent of cavalry, infantry, and artillery from Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Missouri. Van Dorn was aware of the federal movements into Arkansas and was intent on destroying Curtis's Army of the Southwest and reopening the gateway into Missouri. He intended to flank Curtis and attack his rear, forcing Curtis to move north or otherwise be encircled and destroyed. Van Dorn ordered his army to travel light, each soldier carrying three days' rations, 40 rounds of ammunition, and a blanket. Each division was allowed an ammunition train and an additional day of rations. All other supplies, including tents and cooking utensils, were to be left behind. Prelude On March 4, 1862, instead of attacking Curtis's position head-on, Van Dorn split his army into two divisions under Price and McCulloch, ordering a march north along the Bentonville detour to get behind Curtis and cut his lines of communication. For speed, Van Dorn left his supply trains behind, which proved a crucial decision. Amid a freezing storm, the Confederates made a three-day force march from Fayetteville through Elm Springs and Osage Spring to Bentonville, arriving stretched along the road, hungry and tired. Action at Bentonville, Arkansas warned by scouts and Arkansas Unionists, Curtis rapidly concentrated his outlying units behind Little Sugar Creek. On March 6, William Van Devers 700-man brigade marched a remarkable 42 miles in 16 hours from Huntsville to Little Sugar Creek. Curtis's right flank suffered from the mistake of his second-in-command, Sigel, who sent a 360-man task force to the west, where they would miss the next three days of fighting. Sigel also withdrew a cavalry patrol from the road on which the Confederate army was advancing. However, 
Colonel Frederick Schaefer of the 2nd Missouri Infantry, on his own initiative, extended his patrols to cover the gap. When Van Dorn's advance guard blundered into one of these patrols near Elm Springs, the Federals were alerted. Still, Sigel was so slow in evacuating Bentonville that his rear guard was nearly snared by Van Dorn on March 6, waiting until the Confederate advance was nearly upon him. Sigel ordered his 600 men and six guns to fall back on a road leading northeast toward Curtis' position. The 1st Missouri Cavalry led by Elijah Gates attacked from the south to cut off Sigel's retreat. Gates' men surprised and captured a company of the 36th Illinois, but many were freed when Sigel's withdrawing men unexpectedly bumped into the group. Sigel managed to fight his way through Gates' men, helped by a blunder by Brig. Gen. James M. McIntosh. McIntosh planned to envelop Sigel's force from the northwest while Gates closed the trap on the south. However, McIntosh mistakenly took his 3,000-man cavalry brigade too far up an orderly road. After marching three miles out of his way, he turned his troopers onto the road leading east into the Little Sugar Creek Valley. By the time they reached the place where Sigel's northeast road met McIntosh's eastbound road, the Federal General's men had just passed the intersection. A southern attempt to press the pursuit was repelled when the 3rd Texas Cavalry charged, only to run smack into Sigel's main line. The Confederates lost 10 killed and about 20 wounded to Federal artillery and rifle fire. Geography Curtis placed his four small divisions astride the Telegraph or Wire Road in a fortified position atop the bluffs north of Little Sugar Creek. From the creek, the Telegraph Road went northeast to Elkhorn Tavern where it intersected the Huntsville Road leading east, and Ford Road leading west. From Elkhorn, the Wire Road continued north and down into Cross Timber Hollow before crossing the border into Missouri. From there, the Federal Supply Line followed the Telegraph Road northeast to St. Louis. The hamlet of Leetown lay northwest of the Telegraph Road, about halfway between Curtis' position on the Bluffs and Ford Road. Curtis made his headquarters at Pratt's store, located on the Wire Road between Elkhorn and Little Sugar Creek. Van Dorn sought the Federal rear via the Bentonville Detour. This ran from Camp Stevens, west of Curtis' position, northeast onto the Pea Ridge Plateau. A 12-corner church, which still stands today, Ford Road branched east to Elkhorn. The detour continued northeast, meeting the Wire Road just north of Cross Timber Hollow. South of the Bentonville Detour, west of Cross Timber Hollow, and north of Ford Road lay the militarily impassable Big Mountain. On the night of March 6, Carl Grenville Dodge, with Curtis' approval, led several parties to obstruct the Bentonville Detour, felling trees on the road between Twelve Corner Church and Cross Timber Hollow. That same evening, Van Dorn's army, Price's division leading, began the long march to Cross Timber Hollow. The night march was slowed clearing Dodge's obstructions, Van Dorn's lack of an engineer corps, poor staff work, and the soldiers' exhaustion. Battle, March 7. Contact Van Dorn had planned for both his divisions to reach Cross Timber Hollow, but by dawn, only the head of Price's division had made it that far. Because of the delay, Van Dorn instructed McCulloch's division to take the Ford Road from Twelve Corner Church and meet Price at Elkhorn. That morning, Federal patrols detected both threats. Not knowing where the Confederate main body was located, Curtis sent Dodge's brigade of Col. Eugene A. Carr's 4th Division northeast up the Wire Road to join the 24th Missouri Infantry at Elkhorn Tavern. But Dodge, still worried about the threat to the Federal rear, had disobeyed orders and pulled his brigade back to Pratt's store, available to immediately reinforce Elkhorn. Curtis also sent a task force under Carl Peter J. Osterhaus north to reconnoiter along Ford Road. Osterhaus' force consisted of Carl Nicholas Grusel's brigade of his own 1st Division, several cavalry units led by Carl Cyrus Bussey, and 12 cannons. 
Lee Town McCulloch's force consisted of a cavalry brigade under Brigadier General James McIntosh, an infantry brigade under Carl Lewis Aubert, and a combined force of Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole cavalry under Brig. Gen. Albert Pike, McCulloch's troops swung west on the Ford Road and plowed into elements of the Federal Army at a small village named Lee Town, where a fierce firefight erupted. At 11.30 a.m., Osterhouse rode north through a belt of timber onto Foster Farm and witnessed an astonishing sight. McCulloch's entire division was marching east on Ford Road only a few hundred yards away. Despite the odds, Osterhaus ordered Bussey's small force to attack to buy time for his infantry brigade to deploy. Three Federal cannon began shelling the Southerners, killing at least ten. McCulloch wheeled McIntosh's 3,000 horsemen to the south to attack. The mass Confederate charge overwhelmed Bussey's force, stampeding them and capturing the cannons. A little further west two companies of the 3rd Iowa ran into a Cherokee ambush and were similarly routed. The Iowa unit's unusual kill-to-wounded ratio, 24 killed and 17 wounded, suggests that the Native American warriors killed a number of wounded Northerners. Some, perhaps all, of Trimble's wounded Iowans were murdered and at least eight were scalped, south of the belt of Timberlay-Oberson's field where Grusel had time to form in his brigade and nine cannon on the forest edge on the south side. Sol Ross alertly led the 6th Texas Cavalry in pursuit of Bussey's force, but when Ross rode into the field, his men were fired on and quickly fell back. Grusel shook out two companies of skirmishers from the 36th Illinois and posted them along the southern edge of the belt of timber between Oberson's and Foster's fields. The Federal gunners began lobbing shells over the belt of timber. Though the howitzers were fired blindly, their first shell bursts panicked the Cherokees, who rapidly retreated and could not be rallied. Meanwhile, McCulloch had formed Lewis Ebbett's 4,000-man infantry brigade across a wide front and sent him south. Eber took control of the four regiments east of the north-south Lee Town Road, while McCulloch took charge of the four regiments west of the road. The Texan general rode forward into the belt of timber to personally reconnoitre the federal positions, and coming into range of the Illinois skirmishes was shot through the heart. McIntosh was quickly notified that he was in command, but his staff, fearing that the death of their popular leader would dishearten his soldiers, made the unwise decision not to share the bad news with many of the subordinate officers. Without consulting Ebert or anyone else, McIntosh impulsively led his former regiment, the dismounted 2nd Arkansas Mounted Rifles Regiment into the attack. As the unit reached the southern edge of the belt of timber, it was met with a mass volley from Grusel's brigade and McIntosh dropped dead with a bullet in him. In the meantime, unaware that he was now in command of the division, Ebert led the left wing of the attack south into the woods. Meanwhile, the colonels of the right-wing regiments withdrew to await orders from Ebert. It was about 2 p.m. The blind federal bombardment of Foster's farm and the breakdown in the Confederate command structure began to destroy the morale of McCulloch's division. Ebert's powerful attack was stopped in the nick of time by Col. Jefferson C. Davis and the 3rd Division. Davis was originally destined for Elkhorn, but Curtis diverted his troops to Lee Town after Osterhauer's report reached him. The four southern regiments nearly overran Davis's leading brigade under Carl Julius White. Davis ordered a cavalry battalion to charge, but this effort was easily routed by the southern infantry. When Carl Thomas Patterson's brigade arrived, Davis sent him up a forest trail to envelop Ebert's open left flank, and troubled by the inert Confederate units on Foster's farm, Osterhaus was able to box in Ebert's right flank. After very hard fighting in dense woods, the Confederates, pressed from three sides, were driven back to the Ford Road. In the smoky confusion, Ebert and a small party, having become separated from the rest of the left wing, blundered through a gap in the Federal lines and got lost in the woods. 
Later that day, a federal cavalry unit captured Ebert and his group. At this point, command of McCulloch's division would normally have devolved upon El Canar Greer, the commander of the 3rd Texas Cavalry Regiment. But due to the prevailing command confusion, he was not notified of his superior officer's death or capture for several hours. In the meantime, Brig. Gen. Albert Pike, technically outside the chain of command of McCulloch's division assumed command on the Leetown battlefield around 3 p.m. At 3.30 p.m., even as Ebert was still battling in the woods, Pike decided to lead the regiments nearest to him in retreat back to Twelve Corners Church. This movement took place in total confusion, several units being left behind on the field, some marching back towards Camp Stevens others around Big Mountain towards Van Dorn and the rest of the army. At least one regiment was at this point ordered to discard its arms and bury them for later recovery. It was only several hours later that Greer assumed command of the remaining forces and was at that point informed of Pike's actions. Initially, he considered remaining on the battlefield but after consulting with Van Dorn decided to withdraw his forces as well and join the remainder of the army in Cross Timber Hollow, Elkhorn Tavern around 9.30 a.m. Cernel's cavalry battalion in Price's advance guard bumped into a company of the 24th Missouri Volunteer Infantry in Cross Timber Hollow. Soon after, Carr arrived at Elkhorn Tavern with Dodge's brigade right behind. Carr spread out his regiments facing north along the edge of the plateau near the tavern and pulled the 24th Missouri back to cover their left flank. At the base of Big Mountain, the 4th Division commander then sent the 1st Iowa Battery's four guns forward to slow the Confederate advance. At this point, Van Dorn, instead of rushing Carr's badly outnumbered force with all 5,000 of his available soldiers, became cautious and ordered Price to fully deploy his division. With the Missouri State Guard divisions on the right and the Confederate Missouri brigades on the left, when the northern guns began firing, Van Dorn ordered his own artillery into action. Soon, 21 southern guns were pounding the Iowa cannoneers. By the time Price's infantry finally began edging uphill toward the Yankee guns, they met Carr's men advancing downhill in an aggressive counterstroke. The Confederate advance stalled near Elkhorn, but Price's left flank units were marching up Williams Hollow further to the east. Once this force reached the plateau, Carr's right flank would be turned. By 12.30 p.m., Carr's 2nd Brigade, Van Devers, arrived at Elkhorn. The Federal Division commander immediately launched this unit in a counterattack on Price's right flank. Superior numbers of Southerners eventually forced Van Devers to pull back a short distance uphill. At 2 p.m., Van Dorn found out that McCulloch's division would not be meeting prices at Elkhorn. At this time, Henry Little, on his own initiative, waved his 1st Missouri Brigade forward and the rebel advance began to roll uphill. These events finally convinced Van Dorn to take more aggressive action. Price was wounded but remained in charge of his left wing while Van Dorn took tactical control of the Confederate right wing, but more time was lost in reorganizing Price's division to attack. Meanwhile, Curtis was rushing small units to Carr's assistance as quickly as he could. Carr himself was wounded three times, in the ankle, neck and arm, but refused to leave the field. In 1894 he would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions this day. About 4.30 p.m., Price's left emerged from Williams Hollow and attacked, outflanking Carr's line. On the right, Dodger's brigade collapsed after putting up a terrific fight at Clemens Farm. On the left, in equally hard fighting, Van Dever's men were steadily pushed back to the tavern and beyond. In the center, Little led his men forward into the teeth of Federal artillery. After being forced back from position after position, Van Dever's men finally halted the Confederate drive at Ruddick's Field, over a quarter mile south of the tavern. There they were joined by Dodge's men, part of Alexander S. As both 2nd Division and Curtis, 
At 6.30 p.m., Curtis launched a brief counter-attack, but soon recalled his men in the dark.